Okay, we should probably get going. Um, I'm going to start and introduce each one of you. And if you just want to go in and talk a little bit about how you got to your current job and a little bit about like who you represent and what you do, um, that would be great. So let's start with Omar. Here we have Omar Garcia. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I think I know everybody in here mostly. Um, I work at CA. I do uh, Latin music. Uh, been at CA for seven years. Harold and I used to work together. I truly miss Harold. He knows that. Um, and uh, basically that, you know, we've been at it for, for seven years. I started in the mailroom there. Um, didn't really have any other goal but to, to you know, to, to work at CA and, and, and develop Latin talent. And uh, got the opportunity to work international touring. And then from there, got the opportunity to jump on my own and do all the all the work that I now do. Um, I work with you know several genres, uh, mostly just uh, I started with Spanish uh, international artists coming to the Mer to America. Um, I work with uh, people like Aloncho, Sidarta, eh, Mon Laferte, Porter. Uh, now working with like Aleman. Uh, the whole homegrown collective, which is a lot of uh, urban artists, I mean, uh, not urban, sorry, um, rap and hip hop artists. Um, and uh, Tatiana Hazel, who's a new artist, who was, uh, you know, uh, an LAMC, uh, New Discovery Award, uh, and just several people all around. I do also work with other teams in, uh, in, in you know, in Anglo music, if you want to say it that way. And, uh, and basically just working on the developing like the multicultural side of CAA, which has come a long way since I started. And, uh, you know, we're very happy. We feel the future is holding some good things, so. Great. And we have Richard Vega here. Hey, everybody. Um, where do you start? So I've been at WB now for five years. I'm an agent that books all of South America for the entire roster. Uh, I represent uh, everyone. I, I mean, Nikki Jam, Tiny, Kea, a bunch of up-and-comers. Nikki Nicole, a young lady out of Spain called Alicia, who just signed recently. Walsh out of Argentina. Um, have a nice little collection of a bunch of up-and-coming acts. Uh, I ended up at WME. I was a musician prior to coming to WME. Um, and I toured and played with a bunch of bands. I lived in six, six or seven different countries in Latin America, the Caribbean. And... Um, been here since, you know, very similar to what Omar does. My job is to, you know, alongside, you know, Rob Marcus and a few other agents, you know, we're about a group of five or six different Latin agents um, that are spread around the world at this point. And similar to what Omar does, our job is to basically champion Latin music internally um, and find the best opportunities and start breaking down the barriers. Um, notably, you know, Jay Balvin, you know, Coachella, first headliner, Lollapalooza, Rosalia internally in our roster, Juanes, uh, the whole heap of artists that we represent. And I feel like we've been, you know, we've done a well, it's the same way that CAA has done a good job. We've done a really good job as well as, you know, helping break down these barriers because the lines in between Latin and the mainstream market are now completely blurred. Um, and our job is to blur those lines even more until they just completely disappear. So that's kind of my story. That's great. Uh, and we have Edgar Martinez here. Hey guys, how are you? Uh, well, I worked at Loud on Life. Um, we're uh, like the third independent promoter, so the third largest independent promoter in the United States. Uh, we mostly worked on the Latino um, genre, but we have some properties uh, that we've been developing for the past few years, um, such as Tequila Bay and some uh, country music festivals. So we're dipping our toes in, into other genres. Um, I've been in the music business for 18 years. I represent a series of, uh, of artists in different, uh, in different positions throughout my career. At EMI, I worked at Sony Mobile. Uh, then later I worked, I joined CMN um, with Henry Cardenas. And uh, uh, three years ago, I joined uh, Loud and Life. And uh, ever since we, we, we grown a roster, uh, we signed uh, multiple tours uh, in the past couple of years, very successfully. Juan Luis Guerra, Franco Evita, Ricardo Montaner, Chola Serio, um, Parruco, which is an artist from um, 
our colleagues from uh, um, WME. Um, um, Carlos Vives, Silvestre Angon, and many more uh, to come. And we have Harold here as well. Hey guys. Hi, um, I'm Harold Froge. Um, I guess I'm the only Asian American here. Um, but uh, it's an honor to be with you guys and I really appreciate the opportunity. So my background, I've kind of been around the block. Uh, I started at uh, WME at the time it was called William Morris Agency. Now it's WME, but I started in Melbourne there. and. Um, and uh, I was the international coordinator. So I got my feet wet working in the international business, working on tours, again, as, as like an assistant uh, coordinator position with the Eagles, um, Whitney Houston, Chuck Berry, Mariah Carey, and so on. And after three years there, uh, I went over to CAA and um, I, that's where most people know me from. I worked there for uh, almost 12 years. And um, my position there, was mostly private and corporate events, but I got my feet wet there working with Tayo Cruz, Daddy Yankee, uh, Leona Lewis, Jabberwockies, and so forth. And then after that, I eventually ended up over at UTA, um, working there again in the private and corporate space, but still working with um, pretty much the entire roster from contemporary to comedy to AC, everything they had. Um, and then after that, I was over at, uh, most recently at ICM, and uh, just last year, I decided that, hey, it's, it's time. I've been in the business for, at that time, it was about 19 years. I'm going on 20 years now to try something new and uh, give it a shot. So I started Epico Artists, which is a uh, booking and talent agency dedicated to Latin and multicultural artists. And today I work with Elvis Crespo, Melina Leon, Jabberwockies. Uh, just recently, I was doing stuff with Claudia Leche. Um, and in the past, I've worked a lot with Daddy Yankee and Nati Natasha. And we also have Layla here. Hi, um, this is Layla Cobo. So I've been at Billboard, it feels like forever. I actually did have a life before Billboard, believe it or not. I was the, the pop music critic at the Miami Herald. Before that, I started... Um, writing about music at the LA Times. I am a classical pianist. I don't do anything with classical music now, sadly, um, but I've been a, at Billboard a long time. Um, it's gonna be 20 years next year. And uh, really it's been, I know, right? Um, it's been about, <laughs> about building, building Latin. Uh, when I started, um, Billboard had a Latin column um, and uh, and that's what I was hired to do. I was hired to write a weekly Latin column back in the days when there was a weekly magazine. And uh, of course that has evolved tremendously. And uh, that's been really my uh, my my flag, no? to, to grow Latin presence in Billboard, to grow awareness of Latin music uh, worldwide. It's very important to me that Latin music and Latin artists get recognized on equal terms as other genres. And uh, I mean, I'm very devoted to that. Uh, in Billboard, we've really grown the space for Latin artists or Latin music conference is our most successful conference for the brand overall. Uh, so we're very proud of it. We have the Latin Music Awards. We also inform the Latin AMAs because now uh, De Clark Productions is part of, of our family of MRC. And, uh, and we're just growing the Latin beat. Obviously, we, we were a little bit <laughs> derailed by COVID, but we are going to have a, um, our conference in the fall. We are going to have the awards in the fall. And um, I will say that it continues to be a challenge to have Latin music seen on equal terms. And I think we saw that with the Grammy announcement last week of what was happening with the Latin Grammy categories. And where I stand is no secret because I wrote a column about it. Um, but um, but I, I do see more and more acceptance for Latin music and, and my hope is that that grows. And, uh, and it's great to be here with all of you. I've known you and wow, really impressive backgrounds guys. So you learn something new every day. 
And last we have Yvonne. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. I know a couple of you guys. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so I work in the music publishing side. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles and um, I work in the Latin division. Um, I represent songwriters, although the majority of my roster happens to be writer artists. So it's a lot of artists that write, you know, compose and or write and produce their own uh, material. And um, I've been at Pure Music for this February is 17 years. I'm right behind you, Leila. So I guess I'm officially a music publisher, although like Leila, I did have a life before. Um, I did have a life before Pierre. So I worked, um, I started my career in, a little over 30 years ago in, in Rock en Español, working in uh, what's now called Latin Alternative. Um, and I was doing uh, promoting for a lot of Latin rock bands uh, here in the United States. I had a job at EMI Latin for a few years. I got to work with Selena Quintanilla and a bunch of other artists that were really incredible in that, during that early 90s period. Um, and then I went on the road with some of the Latin, uh, Latin rock bands that we were working with at the time. I was a road manager for about three years. And then I started doing publicity. I left Latin completely. I did PR for a few years at Rhino Records and worked with the Ramones and uh, Devo and Los Lobos and a lot of really, really cool um, big legacy acts for their box sets and anthologies and stuff that they were putting out. I met Layla actually during that period of time. Um, and then I left there, uh, got back into Latin um, to work with uh, someone who had been a long standing friend of mine, Gustavo Santaolalla, because he was the producer of a bunch of the bands that I was road managing for at the time. Um, and so he offered me a job to run his label, a new imprint that he had started at Universal. Um, and we had on the roster, our first round of um, artists at the roster was Juanes Molotov and a bunch of other artists. And so there were some two really big ones that started out really well. Um, and through my connection, um, through Juanes and Molotov, they were both signed to Peer Music at the time. And so I got uh, poached by Peer <laughs> to go and work for them. Um, and so I've been at Peer ever since. And uh, like I said, I guess I consider myself to be a music publisher, a career music publisher at this point, although I do have a pretty varied background and still kind of dabble in a lot of other stuff because I like it and know how to do it. Okay, that's great. Um, we are going to start the discussion questions now. Um, I will start with, um, and this is just to um, the Latin woman that we have on this panel. Um, what is your personal experience being a Latin woman in the industry? That's the loaded question of the day. Wow, we're going to start off strong. <laughs> um, you know, like it's kind of all over the place. Sometimes it's not so bad. Other times it's not so great. <laughs> it just depends, you know. I think, uh, I mean, you know, I've been doing it for a really long time and I'm super used to being the only, I mean, I was on the road in a tour bus with like 15 dudes, <laughs> you know. So I got used to like being the only girl in the room and being able to sort of just get stuff done. I never really thought about my gender as being an issue. I just didn't even, you know, I guess if you don't think about it being an issue, it's not an issue. So you just keep going. Um, but you know, there have been moments when it's, you know, been a little more difficult to convince people of, you know, maybe my ability or something, but you know, it's never really been a problem, but you just have to kind of understand that more, more often than not, you're probably going to be the, the only girl. And so you just kind of, move on from there. But you know, I don't know, maybe Leila, I don't know if you have had similar or different experience. I think my my situation is different because I'm not on the road like you are, Yvonne, and I, I've dealt with a different part of the industry. And of course, in media and journalism, there's a lot of women. So I don't, I mean, yeah, I have to deal with a lot of uh, male executives all the time. And uh, Yes, there have been times where I feel they would have treated me differently if I were a guy, but I, I've never felt that that's been a huge issue um, or, a, or a handicap. I think what I, what I do think is still a struggle is being a Latina in the industry. That I find is, um, is my bigger challenge. Uh, the fact that I you know, I'm not, well, I am American now, but uh, I'm born in Colombia. I speak with a slight accent and I move in the mainstream world. Um, I think some people still have a struggle with that. I don't know how it is for the other people in the room, but I certainly find that I have to 
maybe speak a little bit louder, maybe be a little bit more forceful, maybe be a little bit more insistent so that people realize that just because I speak like this doesn't mean my IQ suddenly went down 10 points. And, uh, and that continues to be a challenge, surprisingly. I find that. I find that. Thank you. So our next question we wanted to ask, uh, any panelists feel free if you have a response to come forward. Um, we wanted to ask if you think that there will be a time that Latin artists are able to have complete full reign of their creative direction, or if you think that their audience base is too conservative for that. Um, anybody want to go? Oh. Um, I, me, I think so. I think it's coming to that point. I feel the, you know, music, there's so, there's just so much music out at all times that there's a little bit of, a little bit of something for everybody. So at the end of the day, those paths will cross and people will run into music that they maybe didn't really like at some point, but certain artists is going to make them like it. I think that, uh, there's just a lot of more openness. I think people are becoming a little bit more aware that, you know, being happy doesn't mean you need to like, like or dislike someone. It's more about just being content. And I think that that's kind of spreading out like the, you know, this COVID moment really is making people look inside rather than just, you know, their normal life. So I believe we are coming to that time. I believe that music will eventually just you know, all Spanish music will be kind of listened by everybody. A little bit here, a little bit there, but not criticized so much. Like, you know, like my dad used to hate rock. You know, I couldn't buy a Caifanes album because it was for marijuana, you know what I mean? And so, and now it's just fine. It's just rock music. It's, uh, and so there is, I think there is a moment that's taken me 30 years or so, but, uh, but you know, Bad Bunny and things like that kind of coming through with their own style and crossing, you know, even like, you know, just more fluid and, and, and all that stuff. I, I think, I think we're getting there. It, it seems like inevitable to be quite honest. Yeah. I was going to add that the fact that Bad Bunny is the most popular Latin artist or one of the most popular Latin artists right now. And he's so, you know, the, the things he says, the things he does, um, his, his new vid video of Ella Perrea Sola where he, dread, where he dresses up, you know, in drag and drag and so widely accepted. I think that just shows that we've come a long way, especially in the last couple of years. And I think like, I think like older generations find it kind of like, you know, they'd be like, oh, you know, they'll have their comment, but then they'll think it's kind of, funny so they'll accept it because of his charisma you know what i mean i think like it also has to do with the charisma of the people so i feel like you know all artists have charisma obviously that's why they're artists but you know bad bunny has this something you know like my aunt showed me yesterday we had a, we had a barbecue at my house and she showed me she's like i really like the song the one that says uh cuando vea tu mama and i said you should watch the video and she did and literally my aunt's 60 and she was like i love this so that's, it's kind of perfect that you mentioned the question because it really happened yesterday. And, and I mean, it's an old video also. So I don't know. Bad one, he's just, he's just great all around. I think um, if I could just add one thing too, I think that, it, and it's not specific to the Latin genre, I would assume that in pretty much every genre in music, it's kind of the same thing. But there's, you know, there's always gatekeepers as an artist is, you know, growing and maturing and, you know, deciding, you know, going from an independent artist to maybe a major label. And, you know, your reference to whether they're going to have full creative control is really going to depend on who those gatekeepers are and who um, they're surrounded by, how much leverage they have when they get into a situation of maybe upstreaming from, from completely independent artists to a major label. And, you know, the people that they're working with, allowing them that opportunity to continue to be as creative as they want to be or you know, putting restrictions on them, kind of self-imposed restrictions sometimes as to what they think is going to work in the market and not work. And, you know, so that kind of thing, you know, kind of comes into play as well. But, you know, hopefully as, as the generation of music executives continues to mature, that maybe there will be a little more open-mindedness as to 
you know, you don't have to fall really into this box in order to be successful in the Latin market. I think. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Um, can either of you speak to what um, trying to get an artist feature was like before versus now for Latin artists? I mean, I, I'll jump in. I mean, it's still hard, honestly. I'll be very honest. I mean, I've one of the things that I do with a, with a lot of these clients that I work with is I'm introducing them to managers. And one of the things that we lack in this business, or at least in the Latin space, is management, right? So a manager comes in and they end up saying, I don't know anybody, right? So one of the things that I do is kind of try to prop them up is you put them in the room with the right managers, um, people who they can also look into as mentors, right? Like Rebecca Leon is my, one of my mentors, but at the same time, I'm asking her to mentor people who I'm working with because I feel like they will benefit the most. Um, it will help our business just overall, right? So in terms of featuring, I've, I still to this day struggle um, just getting my acts, you know, in the room with some of these managers because managers, at least from an Anglo side, aren't open to the idea, or if they are open to it, it has to be Bad Bunny, has to be Daddy Yankee, it has to be, you know, so forth. But, you know, kind of what we end up doing internally is we build these teams where they're crossover teams. You have different agents from different genres um, that are a part of these teams for these artists and who are going to vouch for these managers. So, for example, we had uh, Kea, one of the acts I work with from Argentina, um, you know, we're close with One Republic's manager. You know, through Interscope, through Near, and on our end, everybody was able to push on the management front to be able to get One Republic um, to, to have Kea on the feature for this song, right? So yeah, it, it really depends on the buttons that you're pushing um, and kind of to a certain extent the leverage that that artist will bring to the artist in the region, right? So a lot of these acts are trying to break into South America a little more. Um, so how big are your numbers down there? So as a way of expanding their business model in different countries and through Latin America, um, that's kind of one of the pitches that we do. So Kea being one of the, the, in my opinion, the strongest trap artist after Paulo Londra, um, you know, that's a, that's a big conduit for these acts to be able to break in the region. So it's, it's hard, but at the same time, when they have the data and they have the information and they realize how beneficial it is to get these acts to jump on their songs, I mean, they're more open to the idea. But I think, that, again, it's just going down to breaking down that first barrier to get them to understand, you know, how good these artists are for their career sometimes. So my two cents. Yeah, if I, if I may add, it's, 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 this is a, a numbers game. Everything is now so trackable. Everything, you have a number for everything. You have so many likes and so many views and so many and so many listeners and so many million subscribers. So ultimately, it becomes, uh, it becomes, uh, um, if you will, it, it's, it, has to, it has to make sense for the, uh, for the Anglo Act, even, even to, to, do, to do a collaboration among Latinos. It's hard. It's not even, it's not even, um, it's not even uh, between an Anglo and a Latino. It's, it is so hard to, to, to find, um, to find an, an honest uh, collaboration just for the, for the love of the music. It's not happening. That's uh, that, that, that much I can tell you. I, uh, you know, among all, all the things, I manage a band, uh, which is uh, like an iconic band. It's called Orishas. It's one of the, like one of the, biggest bands in, in, in rap and Latino rap. They came through 20 years ago and uh, they're true to their, to their music. And, uh, and I mean, we pitch a couple of times and even though they're big and we tour constantly, we do more than a hundred days a year with them. There's no big act that they would like to, they would like to do something with Orisha because Orisha doesn't have 30 million followers or 200 million likes or whatever. It's, it's, it is like that. So I think it's a, there, there's a lack of, um, there's a lack of empathy among musicians uh, to, to collaborate just for the pure fun and for the, for the joy of doing something together. It has to be, it's always about the number. It's always about what, what are you going to do for me that it's going to, that is going to help 
out my career that is going to help out uh, in my numbers. And it's not for, okay, I love that song. I think that song is great. And, you know, I'm not saying everyone is like that, but it's, it's you know, going back to the management, I think management is, is a crucial thing. Management is, is, is always encouraging the artists to do only things that make sense commercially, not necessarily um, for the love of the music. All right, guys, this is for uh, anybody in the panel who'd like to answer. Uh, my question is, uh, does it seem like male Latin artists are moving away from romantic music and towards showing off their uh, machismo, if you will, in their music? I think that kind of depends on the genre, too, like under the umbrella of, you know, Latin music. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, like in the regional Mexican market for a really long time, it would be like these artists that did not corridos, that's all they did. And then they did the one romantico so they could get on the radio, you know, and that was the one that they got on the radio with, um, you know, and so I think there's a little bit of that also happening and, you know, and maybe um, like across genres at this point. I don't think anybody will ever stop completely doing romantic music because people love that stuff. Right. Like they love a good heartbreak song or a good love song and I mean I know I always encourage my um you know my writers to because you know like I said they're they're mostly writer artists and so I encourage them to have you know diversity in the in the, in the music lyrically to have diversity in the music that they're working on you know to make sure that they or like sync is always kind of a thing for us too and so I'm like you need to write firework in Spanish <laughs> you know like the Spanish uh, version of you raise me up or whatever that you know those are the things that can get synced and so it, I think it's incumbent upon us also to encourage um, our artists and writers to continue to do stuff but I don't I don't ever see it going away but you know I also think that it's important for an artist to be authentic and to do what comes naturally to them I I agree I don't I mean I agree and I'll add I don't think as you'll ever kind of move away from having some romantic part in your music it's just almost like it's almost like a brand for latin people you know what i mean like you can have a lot of these hardcore songs but some of them might be mixed with some love in it you know it might be like hard love if you want to say it but uh like like you say like, like yvonne says like they're always going to have this one song this one really good one that hits you around the heart and and they go you know and like it, it's all forgiven in a way so, so, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't, I mean, not, not, not like fully moving, but they're, yeah, I don't think they're moving away from, 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 from romantic. But, music. but, but I, I will say that reggaeton and trap, uh, some of the artists are very hardcore machista. I mean, I, I don't expect everybody to not be sexist in their songs because I, I understand that's part of kind of the idiom of the genre but I, I have to say sometimes I listen to this music to some music and I it dismays me a little bit I like it when when they have a variety and it's not just about uh you know you're whatever perrea, todo el día, and then they mix it up with a little romance that gives it a little breather but certainly reggaeton, trap, hip hop, lean, I think lean more machista than, than other genres. Wouldn't you guys agree? 100%. I don't yeah, think that's that, any further from what it is now. That's, I guess, what I was saying. But, but I think uh, to, to compliment, I think it's, there's the, there's three type of music uh, that this that we're listening now. I mean, we're listening to this like uh, music for the feet, music for the heart, and music for the head. So like you wanna think, if you wanna feel it with your heart, if you just wanna dance to it. And I think that's where everyone is like, some people, the, the machismo is always music for the feet. Nobody wants to sing. Nobody really means to sing. Uh, I wanna do this to you and then like, you don't do that to like, you don't, you don't, you're not singing that out loud in the car. You see what I'm saying? It's like a, it, it, it's, it's a different, it's a different vibe from different moments. Uh, you're laughing, lady. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I think it's, a, I think it's how, you, how would you define when do you listen to certain type of music? And that's 
and and how do you feel the machismo in certain type of environments depending on what you're listening to i think it's i, I don't think machi i don't think the machismo comes out as much as in the romantic i mean it comes out in the, as in the romantic but it comes much more in the in the urban genre than any in, in any other genre Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. So I wanted to ask, um, do, what do U.S. marketing teams need to know for Latin artists? Are, are things different now? Um, or are there still important differences between marketing a Latin artist? Or are things kind of blurred where the marketing efforts are essentially the same? Um, I'll chime in on that. Uh, for myself, I'm, I'm working with a lot of Caucasian promoters who don't typically touch Latin. So I'm acting as uh, a bit of a conduit and really opening their eyes on uh, a future expansion of their business. A lot of these promoters are dealing mostly with just general market, adult contemporary, contemporary American U.S. acts. And they're seeing the statistics and, and what's going on in Latin music. It's, it's everywhere, right? So they're, they're wanting to experiment and give it a try. So for myself, I am putting forward marketing material and showing them the stats of why this can work for you and to give it a shot. And it's, it's working. I mean, we did, uh, I just recently had Elvis Crespo in uh, Southwest Florida um, where they really didn't do much Latin there. I mean, very little, very little, predominantly white area, some Hispanic, they gave it a try and we sold it out. We sold like 3000 tickets like that, huge success. So what that led to was now they want to start doing Latin festivals. And that's, con that's been my pitch, you know, uh, in this last, in this last year of forming my company to, to give it a shot and give it a try because it's just growing at such a exp exponential rate and um, it seems to be working. It, is that in South and in, in, in Fort Myers? Yeah, correct. In Mockley. Yeah, Fort Myers, Naples area. Yeah, it's, it's there's, and we're seeing we're seeing more markets like that, not just there, but other markets. You know, whether it's uh, even in Denver, it's starting to grow and people are taking more chances. So yeah, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Wisconsin, things like that, Ohio. Uh, you know, just states that you would not think that there's marks but but the, the problem is like and i'm going to deviate a little bit it's like there's latin people literally everywhere in america mm -hmm. and, and and like sometimes they have their own little parties promote there's kind of small promoters do like these small like latin parties and they eventually end up being like pretty big like a thousand people and that's where like the anglo promoters don't really see that because they're just not pitching to that they're you know the only people that would would be able to bring an artist would be those promoters and those promoters aren't really getting their voice out because you know cops and like you know immigration and all this like they don't want to they don't have a lot of trouble i don't know if that it, it plays in in a way but but the markets are out there in these smallest like places like st louis and like you know nebraska oklahoma there's so much out there uh and, and with her to our to our, what harold's saying is like these promoters are literally you know calling us now Obviously, in the agency, we have, a, let's say, a territory system, and there's people that book certain clubs, certain theaters, and those people are getting hit up, saying, hey, you know, we heard about this, or like, you know, some trap artist that sounds, you know, like it's American music, but it's in Spanish, and they want to hear it. So th their interest is there. It's brewing up, and, and eventually, you know, the marketing, you know, it won't be the same, but it'll, it'll, it'll be kind of up in the same levels, I feel, you know. I'll give an example. I mean, at least when it comes to the live side, we did Balvin in Nashville. Um, everybody's like, the, you know, what the fuck are you thinking going to Nashville, right? Balvin in Nashville, it's as, it's as red as it gets over here. Honestly, if you go out to a neighbor, you know, in the outskirts of Nashville, there's this little club called Bucanas, right? And what we had told Live Nation was you need to hire directly, um, you know, these street marketers, you know, and it's the only way is to get it out and find where, the holes are kind of like what 
Omar just said, you've got to find those pockets um, and target them. And it's really, you know, find the local station. There's in some markets, you're not going to have a Latin radio station, right? In Tennessee, the only, the, in Nashville, the only Latin radio station is actually an AM station. Um, so you have to know where to figure out and where to find those pockets. Um, and lo and behold, we, you know, they did it the right way and we blew out Nashville, Tennessee. When you had Bad Bunny come out here, he tried to go into arena and they didn't market it the right way with the people they use locally and it tanked and they ended up canceling the show. Right. So it's all about, you got to find those pockets. You got to find who you go to um, and how you basically um, put the music in front of them because getting the awareness out in these markets where it's normally Anglo is always a hard part because you're not going to be marketing your typical, typical billboard, your typical station. So it's about finding those different avenues. I mean, obviously, I mean, the internet's a big part of this as well, but finding those pockets in small towns. And obviously this relates more to live touring more than anything else. Um, but I, I, I would say it also translates into, you know, to a certain extent, record label marketing. So to follow up on that, um, how often do these promoters rely on you to educate them on the Latin market for these artists? The, speaking for those who are new to having Latin artists play at their venue and who are just trying it out. Can you say that all the time? time please? Sorry. Um, how often do the promoters kind of rely on you to tell them, you know, teach them how to find these audiences? Um, like you were saying in Nashville, where you need to find these pockets of people who would show up to the concert, like for these promoters who maybe it's their first time having a Latin artist perform at their venue, how often do they, you know, come to you and ask you like, who, how do I promote this versus educating themselves on it? Well, I think that it's, it's, in, it's in our personal interest to do that. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily wait for them to kind of wonder like, I'm, I'm guiding the boat. So I'm kind of telling him, look, this is the boat you're going to get. And this is sort of how you should have, if you have any questions specific to your market, then, you know, great. But, you know, the Latin market is the Latin market in Nebraska. And it's the same one in Ohio. And it's, it's just, you know what you're selling, but they don't necessarily know uh, how to do it. So right off the bat, some already do, some promoters don't need, don't even ask your question because they know, how to promote a concert, hands down, they're really just good. And, uh, but, but, but you always kind of want to be ahead of that, especially, you know, if you're, you know, just touring in the U S you want to be ahead of that and, and lay it out for them. It's and, and, you know, have it be ready rather than waiting. And then the week of kind of things are getting kind of rocky and you just don't want that because you want to drive the ticket. That's what they want. So from the agency side, that's what you, you know, that's what you, you're just what you're trying to do from, so, so I guess I don't wait, or, or I mean, none of us probably wait. But. Uh, yeah, same thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go right ahead. I would, I would just echo what Omar was saying. I mean, I, I just try to come equipped and give him any advice and suggestions, whether it's uh, radio or so through social media, digital platforms, anything I can do to help move the needle on, on ticket sales. I mean, we want these shows to be a success. So um, for, if, it's, if it's a promoter that's, you know, uh, let's say a, a white a American promoter that's doing this for this first time, it is really important for myself or whoever's on that other side to handhold them through the process and make sure that it's a success because if it's not, they're just not going to do it again. And we want it to be a win. So whatever information I can provide from radio, television, digital media, print, whatever, um, you know, we'll advise and counsel that to the best of our ability. And like, I think what Richard mentioned earlier about managers also like when an artist has a, a good manager they'll be on you about those things they'll be on you about how things are moving and how how a show is going to be portrayed out to the public so you know richard just mentioned that earlier about having good managers and some good managers listen some good manager on on every little dot and you kind of want you know the marriage between both of those things where like a good manager and a super like intense manager you kind of want the middle of it but that really does help like sell a show like that really does help, you know, every little detail, it's important. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, as a promoter um, myself, and we've been doing it for many years, I can tell you that is um, it all depends. Number one, on the on the act, it depends what you we're trying to sell. I mean, we we sell Juan Luis Guerra in in Miami easily, and you would think Juan Luis Guerra in Boston with them with a population of Dominicans that are in Boston. It's like the second population of Dominicans in the United States. Uh, you're gonna sell the show in, in two weeks, and then you, you you find yourself in a predicament because there's not a, there's not even a, a Latino radio station in Boston, and no most people don't know this, and they only have a a, a, a radio station that comes from a, from an AM uh, with a switcher uh, from 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 Providence. So basically, you you don't have even a way to promote a concert in Boston for 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 the Latino community. Uh, obviously, you have the Univisions and the this and the that and the, the Telemundos, but the radio uh, this con this this business is still driven mostly by radio. Even you can say you could say Spotify, you could say anything you want, you could say. Uh, Digital is the skin, yes, it's skin because you can track it. But radio, up to this day, in our community, it's it's skin, and that's the reason because that's the reason why they're still they're still around and it's so relevant. But as a promoter, I can tell you, we we get, we start we're exploding every every single market in the United States. We're doing shows in Kennewick, in in Washington State. We're doing Seattle. We're doing Portland. We're doing things that I'll never think of. Them from five five years ago, because uh, as Omar said, it's, there's there's Latinos everywhere in this country, everywhere. Missouri, South Dakota, obviously the price the the, the price tag of the artists will allow you to take them, you know, certain places and some other places that will not be able to to you will not be able to to afford the artists in, in that market. But to 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 round it up, um, yes. We as promoters learn a lot from from agents. Um, yes, we sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we do listen. Sometimes the agent is pushing for is, push, is they're pushing for shit that don't fly. Uh, it's true. It is true. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna give you a a, perf a perfect good example of this. It's just, and this is um, well known to to a lot of people. I mean, as we we signed up for a for a show with Farruko in Miami a few months ago, um, and um, it, it was it, we we actually got into the business when the show was already on sale. So the the artist the artist went ahead and put on put up the show by himself, and uh, and he did it. And uh, he did it, and uh, and then we came on board because he felt uh, he felt that he was lacking the marketing support, and he didn't have the, the tools to to get it off the ground by himself. But um, a colleague of Richard um, from from William Morris, um, you know, pushed and pushed and pushed. We we were not we were not sure, but he sold it. He put it together. He he came to us, and he told us, "Hey, you know what? The manager is on board. Everyone is on board." We're gonna push this. We're gonna push the shit out of the show, and we're gonna make it happen. And it was a complete success. It was. It was a sold out show. It was a. It was amazing. Success. It was amazing. So it was an amazing show at the American Airlines Arena. Everyone made money, and and the and the artist was the artist was as happy as you could get. I mean, it was amazing. And uh, but that's that is that is the perfect example where where an agent push the proper way the promoter it, it, it pushed us to to a point that we believed in the in the project and we engaged with the project and we it, it happened because of him I, I remember richard talking about that scenario i mean it was the perfect timing of everything coming together but richard's my richard lom is my colleague he, he runs point and parruco and he brought up that he we were just talking about it actually today because he was mentioning to me of the conversations you guys are having right now and we were we brought up the Miami thing, and 
honestly, it was just a combination of the market being dry, everything. It was a perfect storm of everything coming together. And you guys blew out the American Airlines. I mean, it was amazing. So I take my hat off to both of you guys no, on that one. No, and, and it was in January, which usually you don't, do shows, you don't do usually shows in January because you have the, the, you have the mentality. Everyone is broke coming out of Christmas. Nobody has a penny. And nobody wants to spend um, spend money. Everyone is like in cash conservation, trying to get back on their feet after spending in, in, in the Christmas break. And it was January 25th. And the logic was, okay, there's nothing else going on in, in, the, in the city. There's no other act coming up. There's no urban coming up. Let's do it this way. And it was like, we were in the office. We're like, these people are crazy out of, out of their heads. We are not, or this, this, is, this thing is going to tank it. And little by little, little by little. And then one day they came out with a strategy of selling 3,000 tickets in one day. We're going to cut the price for 24 hours and boom, boom, boom. And it was amazing. Boom, it happened. And it just did. And this is all doing by the agency. Obviously, I can give you, I can give you also examples where the agent pushes you to buy the shit. <laughs> and then you tank. Be nice. But, I, I can give you those from Richard too, by the way. <laughs> he may be on the Zoom, just so you know. I hope he is. All right, guys. Uh, I have uh, another question for everyone on the panel. Um, this is this question is more so due to the to our current uh, political situation, I guess. Uh, so the question is: once we start up with the live concerts again. Um, how can we protect undocumented people at concerts from uh, ICE raids? Yeah. If we had the question, if we have the answer for that, whoever has it, please. Send That's it a to promoter me. question. <laughs> please share it. That's a promoter question. Please, please, please share, please. I, uh, I will be, you know, we'll be enforcing that ASAP. Mm -hmm. Tough. I feel, uh, oh. no, it's tough. It, it's, it's not happening. People, people, uh, I mean, I, I, we don't want to get into politics uh, here, but, I, but I think it's the feeling of uh, the immigrant is, uh, and I think this is a little more um, intense on the West coast than it is on the East coast. Um, but I feel the, the, the feeling of the immigrant is, not going to the big venues, uh, they, they, they tend to stay local um, and they don't drive. So this is, a big, this is a big issue for us, the promoters, because we are, we're missing and a lot of people that have the, 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 uh, the muscle to buy tickets, but they don't do it just because they feel threatened by the, uh, by the, by the, by the uh, immigration officers. Mm -hmm. no answer yeah i i mean i, I, don't, I don't i don't sorry go i personally haven't had any experience with that i just uh, luckily that just hasn't come to, to my table but i think um just from stories that i've heard in the past i think it's just upon the responsibility of both agent, artist, manager, um, uh, promoter, and so forth, that if, if we actually know of something like that taking place, you know, in the worst case scenario, worst, worst case scenario, maybe you just cancel the show um, if, if, if you know if it's going to be bad. Um, at, at bare minimum, you want to take all the precautions and I would think warn everybody in advance. Um, through the socials, through through marketing, and let people know that this could happen, um, and give them that fair warning. Um, but it's that's just a, a just a horrible predicament. I, I don't really have the the answer to it. Yeah, there really there really isn't a way to do it. I mean, you it's almost like you're on risk, but but you like you know like Harold says, and, and Edgar say like. You know, you try your best to communicate the possibility. Hopefully, you're doing it in a place where it's not such like, you know, there's not, it's not so intense. Like, right. I'm not going to do it in Arizona. I mean, right. Yes. Arizona would be, you know, it's like a perfect example of, of, of what Edgar was saying. 
uh, in the West Coast, but like, you know, California might not necessarily be that rough, mm -hmm. you know, but there's also places like, you know, uh, you know, Nebraska, Iowa, all these like places where there's that little extra that they, for some reason, don't like Latin people, you know what I mean? And they'll just go ahead and do it. But, you know, um, I'm assuming some promoters at a local level must have some sort of deal with, with the police also like, Hey guys, like, you know, here's some, I don't, again, I can't, I can't be, I'm not speaking for anyone right. specific, but let's, let's yeah. talk real talk. It's like, yo, you know, what's it, happening yeah. here. Like, let's like kind of look that way. And, and if they don't align themselves in a way, kind of, you know, it, it, guys, it's, it's super easy. Yeah. In Miami, for instance, if you do a show at the American, at the American Airlines Arena, you're not going to have a problem. Right? If you do a show in Homestead for, uh, like, there's, do there, you know, the, I mean, if you know, if you know South Florida, South Florida is, is well known because uh, in the south of Miami, Homestead, there's farms and there's a lot of immigrants working in those farms. So for, for regional Mexican acts, it's, it's very customary to go to those, to, the, to that part of the town and they do smaller shows in that side of the town. So I've heard of raids going on at this, uh, uh, you know, like not necessarily raids, but you know what happens is these people end up drinking at the, at the show. And then the, when they come out, they get a DUI, they get pulled over and then automatically they get processed for whatever else they have pending with justice. So mm -hmm. it, it, is, it, it is ultimately a, a personal a personal decision when you embark it's not only for a concert it's it, the, the daily living of these people is is, is is a nightmare because from one place they can get caught from from their house to their work from their work to the restaurant so it, it is not only a concert but i think it's a more a much broader um problem that they have to face on a daily basis Um, why do you think some fair-skinned Latin artists purposely tan or use dark makeup, even though the lighter-skinned artists are more popular from a sales perspective in the music industry? I don't know. They use dark makeup, do they? Yeah. Because Maybe they want to look tan. I haven't heard. <laughs> no, no, but, but who? I'm curious. I, I... Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, when I was doing research, I found a lot of artists like Jennifer Lopez and Selena Gomez and Shakira over time use dark makeup or tan themselves. And when they came across in interviews, they really had no response about if they felt like they needed to be darker when doing public appearances or on music videos or even in movies like Jennifer Lopez and Selena Gomez. I'll let the women answer that. No, gosh, I, I don't know. I, I This is the first time I hear that. I'm sorry to be so clueless. I mean, I do look better with a tan person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think I was but thinking I it might just be like a personal <laughs> preference choice. Like, I don't think it's a, you know, a political statement or like a cultural statement of any kind. I, I mean, I don't believe it is, but I, I honestly, I don't know. I hadn't heard yeah, me any of that either. But, you know. I know. I, when I was doing research, I thought that was interesting as well. I mean, a lot of the comments were as if they felt pressure that they needed to feel like they had a darker skin tone. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know, like, I, for example, I did hear in an interview once with, um, you know, she's not a musical artist, but Sofia Vergara had talked about her natural hair color being much blonder or lighter. And in order to fit the roles of the, you know, spicy Latina or whatever, she had to dye her hair a little darker. And so like, I, I suppose that there may be, you know, some tiny little underlying stereotype, you know, that maybe people are trying to fit, but I had not heard that myself. And so I would, I would just make the assumption that it's a personal choice, mm -hmm. um, you know, a preference, a personal preference than any sort of, you know, political thing. Or you know to fit in again. You're muted. You're muted. Oh, 
I was just going to say that in my case, I dye my hair blonder because I need to cover my grades and that's the easier way to do it. So that's that. <laughs> I also put these white hairs on here just to make it look like I'm a little older. I also put these white hairs here so it looks a little older. <laughs> all righty, guys. And I have uh, one more question for you all. Um, do you think Latin artists like uh, Selena Gomez, um, you know, so, some more Americanized artists, I would, I would, I suppose, uh, who are finally advocating for uh, Latina and Latino issues, uh, do you think they're genuine or are they just, you know, following, you know, like a certain trend for, for, for money or, or publicity or whatnot? I hope they're, I think they're genuine and I hope they're genuine. Um, a, a lot of Latins that are born and raised here don't speak the language fluently. Right. So some of them have to learn how to speak it fluently. Like Selena Quintanilla did in her day, no? Selena did not speak Spanish well. She had to learn it. So I think there's a little bit of that, of getting comfortable with the language and speaking it and um i want to think that it's genuine i i mean it would be really sad if it weren't i i think um i i do think that it's natural that if an artist is born and raised here they're going to gravitate maybe towards the mainstream perhaps more than the latin because they're born and raised here i mean this culture is so dominant it kind of eats you up but what's happened in the in the past i would say in the past three to five years i don't know what what my fellow panelists will have to say about that but there is increasingly more pride in being latin and more pride in the language and uh and situations where before i think people would hesitate to speak spanish now they're very proudly speaking spanish so definitely, I think there is an increased cultural awareness and an increased cultural pride that wasn't definitely was not there, um, you know, 20 years ago. It's, I, I remember when I first came to this country, when I was living in L.A., I would speak to people in Spanish and they would reply to me in English, even when clearly Spanish was their first language. Right, right, yeah. and, and I think there has been a big shift. So... Um, even if you don't are not singing in Spanish, I think it's natural for people now to embrace their Latinness. Let's call it that more than before. Mm -hmm. I think also it's the household that you 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 grow up in, right? I'll give an example. My younger brother. I mean, I speak Spanish fluently. I mean, I, I spoke Spanish first before I, you know before English. And my brother is we're the, we're about ten years apart, and. Yeah, you know, he 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 understands Spanish. He can speak it, but there's a he looks at it as a certain kind of like an embarrassment because of you know where he will you know grew up and but this was I'm talking about five years ago. Fast forward now to where he's at now, he really embraces it, right? And he's more open to speaking in Spanish, and he's not ashamed of it. Um, and I think that I'm always explaining there's nothing to be ashamed of it. You know, there, there's. This is this is who you are, and you got to be who you are. And you know, we're we're Nicaraguenses, and you know, we, we've got to show and be proud of it, right? Um, and that's I, I think Layla hit it, hit it on the money by saying, you know, it's over the of course of the last five years, you've really seen much more people embrace the fact that they're Latinos. Um, you know, in terms of someone like Selena, you know, I, I think it's 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 genuine, right? I, I've I mean, I was talking to I, I work with Tiny, the producer. Um, and when he goes into the studio, when he, he's working with some of these, these Latin, with these U.S. artists who have Latin background, you know, it's, that's kind of part of the, part of it is you can really tell how real they are. Right. And I would say Selena is hundred percent real about it. Um, and you know, she advocates and she pushes forward. Um, but you know, to Layla's point, I do think we've become much more open over the course of the last few years because it's more acceptable. Right. Um, um, I'm, I was born and raised in Mexico, moved to high school here in uh, McAllen, Texas, um, went to high school here. And I used to see this, uh, this thing where like my friends who were Mexicans or, but raised here, like Leila was saying, 
uh, you just speak English. You just, you listen to, you know, you watch Stay by the Bell. You, you know, you watch the same regular things that everybody watches. You come home and like, there's Univision on. But, you know, you can't talk to your friends about Univision because you got to watch Stay by the Bell so you can talk to them later. So I feel like that on top of the internet and on top of everything that's kind of happened, because it happened literally as this whole thing moved, uh, it, it, it helped people just kind of be like, yo, I, I love, you know, Spanish music and I like this. And now it's just more accepted to be whoever, like Richard says, who you are, like just, this is who we are and it's cool to be who you are. And uh, when, when, when the, you guys mentioned uh, Jennifer Lopez, uh, you know, I used to always say, oh, you know, Jennifer Lopez jumped in the Latin bandwagon and, and that was my thought. But then I realized that back then, you know, when she was in In Living Color, she just wanted to make it. She didn't, like, she didn't care about being white, black, Latin. It didn't matter. Like she grew up in a place where there was a lot of black, a lot of Latin, a lot of, you know, in New York, whatever. So she just wanted to make it. And, and basically it was white and black. And then Latin started kind of becoming more, you know, important to the culture in America. And, it, and so that's when you come out, you, you're just like, oh, cool, this is kind of cool. So I want to I wanna show that I am. And now I realize that my thoughts back then were erroneous just because I didn't know. I come from a different country, you know, I mean, from Mexico, which is right next door, but I come from a different culture. And, right. and, and understanding that about America makes me so much happier because like Lauren Haregi, I didn't even know, to be honest, we work with her, I work with her. I had no idea she spoke perfect Spanish and all that. Like I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And then we had a meeting and we talked in Spanish the entire time. And she's actually just as comfortable speaking Spanish as she is speaking English. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that I realized it's like, they're not really ashamed and not jumping in a bandwagon. It's just like, hey, you know, I can also live this side of my life at right. the same time as the mainstream part of my life, mm -hmm. which is really cool. It's biculturalism rather than bilingual, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all connected, isn't it, right? Because when you, um... When you see Coachella, which always had such few Latin artists, or they, they kind of hid them in like the little stages. And then last year they had Bad Bunny and they had Balvin at the same time and Rosalia. And, uh, and I remember my son went and he was telling me about these performances and how cool it was to see these guys like on the big stage, but they weren't on the big stage before. So I think it, it's all intertwined. When you see them there, then you realize, oh, this is cool. You know what I mean? Like it's not, they're not like relegated to the corner anymore, which I think tended to happen uh, a generation ago. So it was a big corner because it was a massive corner for us, but the rest of the world kind of didn't know about it. Absolutely. I think that example of, of Coachella is a great example. Sorry if you guys can't see me. I don't know what's wrong with my camera. But, um, you know, I was standing side stage when, when, the, when that happened. And before he went on stage, you just hear this uproar of people, you know, just chanting reggaeton, reggaeton, reggaeton when he's coming, right when he's getting ready to come on stage. At that moment, you just look at the sea of people. And I, I remember just thinking just, holy shit, man. No, we've really, we've really broken down a barrier here. You don't realize how massive, you know, that, that was, um, especially having the slot, you know, the, the sunset slot when everybody's there, you know, and you walk through the crowd, I walk through and everybody, you know, there's a part of Balvin's set when he kind of gives a tribute to El Reggaeton from the 90s, you know, he goes back to Wisin Yandel, he goes back to, you know, the, the early Yankee, he, he really goes back to, to, to what, you know, kind of set the model. Um, in that time period of the Looney Tunes time period and it was everybody in the crowd was singing to it dancing to it um, it, it's, it was a beautiful moment just culturally speaking for you know to, to witness that I felt very humbled watching that so I think Layla you're on the money on that one I would just add that, um, you know, there's just a lot more multicultural people um, today versus maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm mixed gender. So, um, 
you know, where I grew up, it was predominantly white and Latino. I'm, I'm half Asian. And there really wasn't a whole lot of um, Asian role models. Um, just didn't exist. Now, fast forward today, I know we're talking about Latin music, but there's like a, a scene, subculture, of that's kind of, that's, you know, just under Latin that's starting to explode with like K-pop and Asian rap. And that's cool. That's really cool. And, and um, uh, I think it's really cool to be, to, to speak, you know, multiple languages and, and have an open mind to different cultures. I mean, you know, I just recently got into salsa dancing and bachata dancing, and I absolutely love it. It's what I, it's what I do for the last three to four years. And, um, uh, and I'm seeing a lot of people my age that are, you know, that are, that are, that are finding it for the first time and they're loving it. And it's just, you know, we're, we're a lot more open mind. I feel like I've always been open mind, but um, I, I feel like the masses are being a little bit more open-minded to the culture and enjoying it and embracing it. That music is just so likable um, and it's danceable and it's fun. So uh, I think, I think you guys should be prideful of your heritage and your culture because it's really cool. And, you know, I'm the perfect example of how it is taking off and how it is exploding. I mean, Asian guy in the Latin music business, that, that didn't exist 20 years ago, but it is now. So yep. um, that's, I, I think it's a good thing. And I think you're going to see more of that. Absolutely. Okay, so for the remainder of the panel, um, we would like to open it up to a few audience Q&A and same situation with the other questions. If any of the panelists would like to speak, feel free to answer. Um, and then we're going to just have a little wrap up question. Thank you all again for being here. So I'm going to start with Carolina. Mia, could you please unmute her so she can answer? You think it's easier just asking the question that she had? Yeah. Well, did you see her question, Carla? I don't see it. Yeah, you just have to go to her specifically. Go to click on Carolina Morales. Okay. And then unmute her so she can speak. be working. Hi. You hear Carolina? Hello everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. So um, hello everybody. My name is Carolina and I am from Ecuador. And my question is um, I would like to ask ask you how do you think that the growing wave of racism and the protective measures against American workers that the president intends to impose will affect to Latinos who want to enter to the music industry? Um, I'll, I'll, I can touch on that a, a little bit. Um, the you know in the last during this presidency, I will say. Um, I have noticed it becoming more difficult for a lot of my artists to obtain visas. Um, the process is much more complicated and takes much longer. Um, and, you know, for, for myself on the music publishing side, you know, because I'm dealing with Latin music, the majority of my artists are not based in the United States. They're all over Latin America. Um, and in order for them, it's particularly developing artists. And so if I'm expecting for them to have um, any level of success in U.S. Latin, I need them to be able to come to the United States. They need to be able to do promotional events. They need to be able to do media. They need to, you know, all of that stuff to get a record deal, all that stuff. Um, and so I would say, 
you know, before this administration, it's always been complicated, but I've seen it particularly, com or just maybe takes a lot longer um, in the last, you know, a uh, few years. So, and it, I hate that it has to be one of those things that I need to ask when I'm talking to a potential writer or writer artist that I'm interested in signing that's based in Latin America. We have to have the conversation about how and when we'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to obtain a visa in order for me to really be able to dig in and, you know, help to develop them. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have a solution to that problem. Obviously, I don't got that kind of juice, but um, I do have to really take it into consideration. And I hope that, you know, um, if and when there is a change in administration that that might ease up a little. I would assume it's the same for my colleagues that are looking at touring, you know, visa issues are, are complicated. And so I, I really don't know how that will get resolved other than to say that potentially with a different administration, maybe we won't run into as many issues. Um, I think one of the other issues to add to that is that Trump has slashed budgets um, all across Latin America, all across in just Latin America. Um, so what your consular would have maybe five or six people, for example, in Colombia, right? I, when I lived in Colombia, you know, there's the head consular, but then you have, you know, the people who work in the consular's office, they've slashed all those budgets. So the lines just to be able to get through the process, the uh, delays are months. Um, we had an artist of ours who was coming in from a country in South America who needed to get his visa, had all the paperwork ready to go. We had the, you know, multiple activities, not, it wasn't shows, but it was activities, recording sessions in the United States. And they basically said our wait time was going to be two and a half months for it. Um, and it came down to a point where, you know, we had to call people to push on buttons to be able to get that appointment, to be able to get the visas. Um, Cause we were on a time constraint, but a lot of it has to do with the, it, they're, they're not just targeting Latinos because they're slashing budgets globally because it's not a priority for the Trump administration. But I would say that they're, you know, it's not just Latinos, but I think they're just making it much more difficult by, you know, they're, they're assigning money elsewhere and taking it where they think it's not going to be a priority. And that to a certain extent is targeting minorities, correct? They are targeting Latinos because they're most, they're more likely to slash a budget in a country in Latin America than they are, say, for example, in Italy, right? So, I mean, I, I hate to say that, um, but that's just the reality. So part of it also stems just from them cutting budgets and reallocating all their funds to more important initiatives that Trump is trying to push in different countries. Um, first of all, there's no grown in racism. There's, <laughs> racism was already there, <laughs> uh, but it, it is very difficult uh, it is very difficult to work with international artists in America. And uh, it has become, it's gonna be more than, it's gonna be close to impossible to get new people, I feel in the next four years uh, to come in as easy as it was before. Like even if you already had a visa uh, and you're trying to renew, the, you basically have to start the process over again. Uh, it's not like they automatically just give you a new one kind of before it was like you already had your file and you had visas and like they gave you and renewed gave you renewed now uh, I believe it's like it doesn't matter if you already had one you're gonna have to kind of start doing it again so is it gonna affect yeah but it's it's I mean and then on top with COVID if you come from probably a country where like COVID was high probably not gonna be able to get a visa I'm I mean, it's just the administration is 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 it's it's, it's, it's interesting to say the least. So. All right, thank you. We're going to open up to another question now. Um, Javier asked a question. Um, do you want to unmute him, Mia? Or I don't know if he has audio. Um. It says that he just, okay, I see it right here. Okay. Hi, hello. Hi, Javier. Hi. Hi, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a South American student. I'm from Ecuador. Yeah, I've been studying, um, MBA on music management in William Patterson's university. So I've been here in the country like for a year and a half. And this was my time for me to do an internship 
uh, to start getting into the music business, but everything just stopped because of the pandemic, you know? So I just wanted to know any suggestions for a person like me, like who is just starting and trying to get into the music business and you know, everything is, it is, it was difficult before the pandemic and now it's more difficult. So just wanted some suggestions if you have. Um, I would assume most companies have kind of put a pause. I know ours did. We put a pause on um, our internship program. Um, and so I'm not really sure, you know, if there's like a deferral for you to, you know, be able to put a pause on it for now. Because I, I mean, honestly, I can't think of any of my colleagues even that would be um, available to offer internships right now because you really won't be able to get like that kind of one on one to really get the benefit, I'm pretty sure most of us have done internships, <laughs> to really yeah. get the benefit of, of being an intern, you kind of have to have that hands-on experience and be able to ask questions and you know kind of be in the room. So um, I apologize, I don't actually have a suggestion for you because I don't know if there are any of my colleagues that are offering virt a virtual experience of the internship Do process. you think I should just wait until next year that everything comes back to normal maybe? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what, what it's going to be like. Um, I would, I mean, next year for like starting January 2021, I, I would, I, I'm really hoping and praying that things will be back to some level of normalcy. Um, I know that in, in, I'm in California, I'm in Los Angeles, and we had a very, very active internship program and had to cancel a few of our interns that were, we were expecting to have this summer. Um, and you know, it, the state of California is, is still kind of a hot spot, And so we're not even planning on reopening the office until potentially July. And even then it's going to be like on a rolling, you know, kind of um, alternating basis with the not even full staff. So I don't anticipate our um, program starting up again until maybe, you know, 2021. Um, but, you know, I mean, you want to get the full experience. It's just yeah. it, internships is the place where you really will get the most hands on the opportunity to really meet the executives. I mean, I can tell you for a fact that probably 100% of the interns that have come through my department, our Miami office, um, the other a and and film and TV departments have all gotten jobs after working up here. Um, and so building that network and being able to like really, you know, show your worth. Um, in that environment is, is, you know, is a benefit that I wouldn't want you to miss out on, you know, because of the, because of the pandemic. Yeah, um, it's difficult because uh, the companies right now, they're in like a little, they're in a little problem in the middle of like, they can't really bring us back to the office because that could be, that could be a lawsuit if you get COVID. Mm -hmm. So if like an intern gets COVID, it's even worse. So Right now, I think that's going to be on hold for a minute. I mean, again, a lot of these companies don't even know. I mean, a lot of companies don't even know they're going to come back to work in a physical office. So I think the internship situation will definitely be, you know, will be different. You'll probably be doing some stuff. You know, luckily you'll get an internship at some point, but you'll probably be doing some of it mobile, uh, you know, away from, from, from an office and, and come once a week. Because we at CAA had these interns and they would come in three times a week only. And, uh, you know, obviously I don't know what they did the rest of their week, but uh, that's like something that already had changed. Like, you know, they weren't doing it every day. And so COVID really, I mean, sadly, COVID really just put us all in a situation where we're meeting over the internet right now. I mean, and so it's, yeah. it's tough. There is, there is internship and you should definitely look up you know, uh, you know, wherever you want to go and just keep bugging one day when they're going to say, Hey, we're open again. And then you'll get one, but you know, just don't, don't stop because of the pandemic, but understand that there's a situation that is going to limit, you know, the, yeah. the immediate success for that. This is that our professor told me that everyone was hoping uh, the companies will start. Uh, we could apply for uh, internships maybe in the fall, but I don't really think that's going to happen. I've been looking and, and, before everything of the pandemic starts, there were a lot of, of internships open that I can, I can apply. But now I'm, I've been looking and there's nothing I can find. I can't find like anything. Yeah. Apply. I mean, if you can apply, apply. 
That's yeah, nice. I've been applying. I'd say the, the, the other angle on this one is, you know what? Got to hustle it, right? You know, volunteer. Uh, do what you can to help people. Reach out to people. The best mentorship, the, the best internship you can do right now is cold call people, uh, email people, try to get on Zooms, try to get to know people. You know, have that person recommend three people to you for you to then reach out to them. That was kind of my strategy when I was an intern because I started as an intern at WME. Um, and you know, it was I would meet one person nice. and then I would have them recommend three people. And from those three people, I would call and, you know, say, hey, X person recommended. So don't take it as a, as a, as a, don't take it from a standpoint of, oh, just because the internships are done, we can't be able, I'm not going to be able to move forward. Take this as an opportunity because more people are available to talk now, right? More people have time. So take that advantage, um, use that to your advantage and, you know, you got to hustle. So that's, that's what I would do. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to end the Q&A with Alessandra. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Alessandra Colucci. I um, currently work at M Theory. Um, we're an artist management uh, consulting company uh, based in New York, LA, and Nashville. Um, I'm the director of production and A&R admin, so I basically run our label operations for distribution. We work with like Major Laser and a lot of EDMX. Etc. Flume. Um, I am of, uh, of Puerto Rican and Italian heritage. I think it's kind of obvious that I'm very Italian by my name. But I had a general question because I haven't had the chance to really work with um, mi gente Latina in the music world and I kind of dabble in and out of it with certain friends that are. And my question is, do you guys feel that as music industry executives you've been segmented by those within the larger music industry and have had struggles to gain traction across both the US and Latin markets, I find that there's a, too much of division amongst colleagues sometimes, like, oh, well, you work in this field, therefore X. Um, or you may not be thought of for certain opportunities. I'm not sure. Uh, for myself, yeah, 100%. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that's just a Latin thing. I think that's just a you know, a corporate business thing. I've always felt like I've always been put in a box. In fairness, you know, if you've been trained one way, they're going to skew you this way. Um, but I hate being put in a box. And hence the reason why I went and ventured out and just started doing my own thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that um, that sort of uh, putting, you know, that sort of discrimination, if you want to call it that, um, exists everywhere. And, um, uh, you know, it's really hard to get out of, you know, for myself, it, it was just about doing it myself, and, you know, proving the naysayers wrong and giving it a try. So um, hopefully, hopefully now with what's going on in the world, things will open up and, and, um, and, and uh, we'll see a little bit more diversity and, um, and people thinking out of the box and uh, we'll see, you know, we'll see. at least that's, that's been my experience with it. Well, uh, I think it's a I think it's a personal choice more than you know. Like I've been working in the Latin in the Latin industry in the Latin music industry for the past twenty years, and I, I never I never even applied um, for a position in a, in the general market. Not because of anything, just just because my expertise was in the Latino field. So I felt. That I, my career was going in, the, and my career is going in that direction. I mean, it's, I don't, I've never, I've never, I, I'll be, I'll be lying to you if I tell you that I've been discriminated because I, I applied to certain job or I, I was trying to get this position and, and I couldn't because, because of my, because of my race. I think it's a personal choice when, when it comes down to. Uh, when it comes down to where your career, as a, when you take a career path and you're going into that career path, I mean, it's, it's obviously like, I'm very good. I consider myself very good at what I do. And, and I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to promote a show of Kanye West to begin with. Because I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know. I don't know the genre. I don't, 
I mean, I know the guy, I know the music, I've, I listen to, I listen to Kanye West a million times, but I don't know how to reach the consumers. Yes, obviously, if you put me in that, in that environment for a year or two or three, I'll be able to do it because ultimately, we as promoters, we, what we do is we, we sell, we, we put bots and, and seats. That's what we do. So basically, it's a, it's a repetitive process all over and over again. So, so I think, I mean, Harold, I mean, you obviously not Latino, but you work with the Latino and the, within the Latino community for, for many years, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so, and, and so this is a perfect example. Yeah, he, you, even if you don't, I know a lot of people, and I know you guys do too. Like, uh, let's put it this way. You, you, own, you own this panel, no Jeremy Norking. He's not here today. But Jeremy Norking is, is a Jewish guy with no roots in Latino, and the Latino, uh, he doesn't have any, any Latino roots in his family. But he, all he does is being, he's been an agent, a very successful agent for the past 20 years. Uh, he's been working in the Latino industry, and he's an American guy. So I think it's a personal choice more than, more than okay, you're not going to be able to, to go into the general market because you don't want to. I mean, I'm sure if I, if I want to go to the general market, I'll get a position and a label. As a, as a label manager, I can I start all over again and lose the 20 years that I have in the, as, a, as a Latino executive in, in, my, in my field. So, so what I, do I want to do that? No, I want to stay here because I think that this is where, where I'm going to be most successful and where I can make more money at the end of the day. I think that's where it kind of tends to go. I, uh, it's also, oh, I'm sorry, Omar, go ahead. No, 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 go on, please go. Um, I think that also, you know, you want to like do whatever you're passionate about you know, and like what you're, cause that's going to be what you're best at. And so if you're really passionate about, you know, whatever country music, whether you're, you know, black or Latino or Asian or whatever, and that's what, you know, it's what you're passionate about. It's what you're good at. Then you should do that, you know? And so, um, I, I've, I'm, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, you know, the child of immigrants from Mexico. And so I've always kind of lived that multicultural, like that both sides. And so, I've been able to work both sides. I mean, I did completely general market stuff when I was at Rhino and now I'm back to doing completely Latin, even though I have a lot of artists on my roster that sing entirely in English that don't even speak Spanish, but they happen to be Latino, you know? So it's the, the lines have really blurred, but at the end of the day, you have to be authentic and, you know, do follow the path that you're the most passionate about because that's, first of all, it's going to make your job fun. And second of all, it'll just, you know, really show, um, you probably will have the most success doing whatever it is that you're excited about. It's not really so much a ethnicity thing. I'll give you an example. I mean, sorry, go ahead, dude. Oh, uh, what I was going to say was, um, so when I started working uh, at WME, I started in the Nashville office and I was the, you know, to a certain extent, I was the odd one out um, because I spoke Spanish. I grew up in Latin America. You know, I, I just very different. And I, you know, country music selling is selling to a certain extent when it comes to, to being an agent, you could sell, you should be able to sell ice to an Eskimo at this point. Um, so my take, you know, when I started in Nashville, I started working just country, 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 country. It was all country. Um, and then my way of, all right, how, you know, it's, it's what everybody's saying. It's what are you passionate about? So I figured out what's the best way also to move up quickly in my career? And it was through being, through doing what I was passionate about. So for me, it was Latin music. So, you know, I spoke to my wife and said, you know what, we're moving to, we're moving to LA. Um, you know, I ended up working out, you know, moved to, moved to LA, was promoted fairly quickly because of the Latin connection. But then now at the same time, I'm now working on country acts, right? So I'm the agent for Kane Brown internationally outside of the United States. So everything at the end of the day comes full circle um, is my take. And you know, don't let, I hate, you know, don't let you know, these barriers or these stigmas or whatever it is, you know, hold you from doing what you feel passionate about. For, for me, Latin music has always been my calling. It was the only way for me to really just be happy, right? So, you know, I gave everything up, you know, career in Nashville of doing country music. I said, fuck it, we'll start from scratch. So let's go move to L.A., and 
in a one bedroom apartment. You know, my wife and I moved into a small one bedroom apartment in LA, middle of nowhere, and moved up from there. And here we are, right? You know, now I have what I would say is one of the most diverse rosters at WME. Um, but it's because at the end, I, I followed my passion. So. Um, I've always wanted to work uh, in, in, in Latin entertainment. So to me, uh, so like Edgar says, it wasn't even like, it wasn't even like a question of someone's going to like look at me different because they, first of all, they probably don't have the skill set that you need, which is very simple. It's just another language. Jeremy Norkin learned it and he's a great agent and Jeremy Norkin is, is really good. And I don't discriminate him at all. He's actually amazing. And, and, and so at the end of the day, it's just about the focus I feel that you have and, and add it to what everyone's saying. It's like, I don't, I don't feel that, that the, the, you know, the mainstream or, or, or whatever uh, entertainment is, it looks at me differently. Like I want my work to go to that level. So that's where like the push comes and like, there's no real, like, no, like no one's going to tell me no. Like, so, so anything that I, that I, that I work on, I want it to be at the best at, at the top. So I've never felt discriminated. I've never felt, I went to Texas Christian university in Fort Worth, Texas, which is very white. I feel just fine. I've never experienced that in the few times that I did, like, it doesn't even like, I, I'm, and I don't mean at a corporate level, I mean, on a personal level, it doesn't even even matter to me. Cause it's like, there's so many different avenues people can take for whatever they want to do. And as long as you like what you do and, and you have like a purpose, my goal was to make Latin entertainment, uh, you know, Latin artists, especially from other countries to basically get to the point where they're proud of what they're doing and make it, make it mainstream in, in a way. And so I think we're at a really an amazing point that there's where if you even today, as of like today, you can't really get discriminated anymore. Because if you do, you know, it's gonna, a lot of shit's gonna happen. Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for sharing that information. Because in my, I work like in in a very like eclectic music company, and my feeling has been that they, you know, they're interested in stuff like this. But I also feel like on the outside that something that I've noticed is that sometimes the Latinos that I see that work in primarily in the Latino music market, there's not enough crossover. So I guess that's the segmentation I was speaking towards. And um, I appreciate all the information you gave as well. And I really resonate with uh, not wanting to be placed in a box because I certainly listen to everything. And I'm from New York and I've like have friends who are Albanian. I listen to Albanian music and I'm not lying. You know what I mean? So I think that's how I would like Latin music to be looked at too, like on the same level to what you were just saying too, Lamar. Like we listen to everything. Harold and I used to listen to Daddy Yankee by ourselves. No one else would listen to it. Just FYI. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, all for coming so thank you all. Go ahead, Mia. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of our panelists for being on. And uh, of course, we went over again, but we had some great discussions. So um, Layla actually did have another obligation she had to head out for. If anyone else does as well, feel free. Um, we just wanted to wrap everything up with asking each panelist to say what they love about work in the music industry. I'll start. Um, <laughs> ladies first. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, some days I don't love it. <laughs> We probably all have that experience every now and then. I'm like, why did I decide to do this again? Um, but, uh, you know, like I can't, I'm the kind of person that I literally cannot breathe without music. Like I can't work without music on. I can't, like the second I get in my car, the, you know, music is on like 24 seven. So I, and I'm completely untrained to do anything else at this point. So um, I just kind of stick with it. But the, the, one thing, the one thing that I do want to say about working in Latin in particular, and one of the reasons why I've stayed working in Latin um, for as long as I have, is that I find that Latin music, it's, because it's not just one thing, you know, it's like this umbrella. And so like, even just in my roster right now at Pier, I have, you know, from, you know, Gloria Trevi and, you know, Victor Manuel, 
and Molotov and then all the way down to the baby bands and like everything in between and like every genre, Latin alternative and, you know, El Commander with regional Mexican. Like I have a little bit of everything. And so I get the equivalent of being able to work in like six departments, you know, as my, in my counterparts in the general market, they only do like hip hop and R&B or they only do rock music or they only, you know, and I get to do all of it. And so it's one of the reasons why I love to work in Latin music is just like the diversity of sounds and, you know, music that I get to be in touch with every day. And the level of talent is always incredible. And I learn something new every single day. Um, and so I, you know, most days I love my job. So I guess I'll continue. Um, as, as Yvonne says, yeah, most days I love my job too. But, um, you know, as a promoter, you have, a, you have a million things that can go wrong, but the things that can go right outweigh uh, those, those bad things. I mean, usually our, our, our job is we're in a big casino every, every day. We're in a, we put out, we, we bet on, we bet on artists and we bet on, we bet on a lot of that, a lot of stuff and a lot of variables uh, that we ultimately can control. And, you know, like we, like what we're, what we're going through right now. And we had a lot of shows and, you know, didn't pan out, but we're, you know, moving forward, we're going to be fine in 2021. But what I love about my job is um, bring after you see the people coming out of the show, when you see, when, when you start planning the show, when let's say Juan Luis Guerra, which is such an iconic and good artist and like wholesome, and that's the type of guy, that, and that's the type of show that when, when people are getting in, they're so excited and you see the people at the show and they're so happy and they're so ecstatic and, you're sharing that moment with another 13,000, 40,000 people. And, and knowing that, knowing that, that, that show came out of a meeting, came out of an idea that we had, uh, say sitting on a table and we, 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 we did the outreach to all these people and these people showed up and now you're creating a memory and you're creating, uh, you're creating, a, uh, that memory forever. I mean, people are touched by the music forever. When you when you go to a concert, and that feeling of having someone next to you uh, singing out loud and just sharing that experience with you, and I think that's why that I think that's why live concert will never die because it's it's exactly that. It's it's just having someone totally unknown to you, a perfect stranger sitting next to you, singing from the top of your from the top of their lungs and without any hesitation and just having a great time. I think that is the most rewarding part of, of, of my job. Just knowing that people go to the shows and they, for, for a couple hours, they just forget about anything wrong that is happening in their lives. That's, that's very rewarding. That's, uh, and I keep on saying this, is, that is the, the most important part of my job. I think I think I agree a hundred percent with what Edgar just said. That's kind of falls in line with the same here. And you know, on top of that is, you know, those moments that you get to experience with people, right? They're one of a kind. Um, and I think there's a, you know, when you when you put all this effort into getting a show done, especially and particularly from a promoter standpoint. I mean, I, I've. Yeah, I, when I sit, when I stand next to a promoter, and you're watching, you know, fifty thousand people just lose their minds. Um, you know, you look at them, you're like, damn, you know, this is kind of what you put together. We put together as a team, everybody did it, you know, and, and, and made it something magical and made it into a nice experience. So for me, that's part of the rewarding part of it. And the other rewarding part of it is, um, you know, when that artist walks off the stage, right? At the moment they walk off the stage, that's, the, that's the moment where you see it in their face and they're drenching in sweat and, They've given everything they can to this show. Um, and they come off and they say, you know, Oye, loco, puñeta, todo bueno eso, right? They give you some sort of, you know, Puerto Rican phrase or a Colombian phrase. They give you something that's saying, you know, much love towards what you, you helped put together and that they enjoyed it. So 
that's that would that's kind of my side of it. Yeah, I would I would agree with everything you guys said. I mean, I just for myself, I really love the music. I really love the culture, and I really love, you know, breaking boundaries on on these things. You know, from, you know, from the simplest things like getting someone who I know doesn't listen to this type of music and like spending five minutes with them in my car and playing it and watching their, you know, their eyes just light up and like, holy shit, I didn't even know this existed. This is amazing. Oh my God. And now you've just turned them into a fan. And then on the other extent, taking an artist, you know, specifically a Latin American artist to Asia where, you know, it's just kind of growing now, it's starting to get there, not there yet, but watching that culture wherever japan china korea and them starting to embrace it that to me is super exciting and that's kind of what i want to work on and and see a lot more of that and um you know just breaking breaking the boundaries it's coming to asia it's definitely coming to asia absolutely you know we did that summer we did summer sonic august of last year and that was the first real test of a you know of a reggaeton artist really going out there and it was insane so you're on the money with that man. yeah I, I had uh yankee in uh beijing uh what two years ago and that was his first time in asia and that was it was such a big yep. deal it's great um what i like more most about working in live is um so when i was a young buck in mexico my dad promoted some shows and uh and i was got to see the backstage part and it was you know it was normal but then as, as a young kid i got to see like the reaction of the people uh kind of like what edgar says and when they walk when someone walks out and you've paid a lot of money or you've saved a lot of money to go see this one artist or or whatever and and then the look in the people's eyes and and just this sort of like they just go blank and you, you know you notice it as a fan just as anybody else but uh when you're by yourself you just like you get the slide, you just can't believe it. And that feeling, uh, that feeling's literally, that's literally why I work in live music. Uh, I just don't, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. There is nothing else, maybe scoring a goal or being in like World Cup or one of those things, it's like very similar to it, but like just knowing that I have been in that position and, and like look back at that person and saying like, the work we've done whatever it is that you get to do, you're promoting or you're signing someone or you're selling them or whatever, just knowing that someone is being touched by that specific thing that you got to work on. That's literally why I work in this. Like there's really no other reason. I mean, I can get, I can go backstage anywhere. I can stand whoever you want. The artists are really cool. Making their dreams happen is really cool. An artist, if it's going to be good, they're going to be good with or without you. Just you're sometimes you're lucky to work with them. Uh, but but that's really it. I mean, just making, you know, one person have that idea of like, this is amazing and everybody else around them, that's just, there's no money to, there's no money for that. There really isn't. All right, thank you all so much for coming and attending this panel. Um, for those of you who are interested in coming to our next one, we are going to release all that information on Wednesday. So look out for that. And thank you everyone for coming and thank you for all our panelists. Oh, thank you, thank for you having all us. for staying on so long. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank right. you guys so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.